to ISIS Parenting's Breastfeeding Webinar and Chat. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm a mom and baby nurse educator, board certified lactation consultant, board certified in pediatrics, and I'm here at ISIS Parenting's home office outside of Boston, Massachusetts, where I am the vice president of e-learning and clinical content. And with me today in the moderation role is Liz Marino, and Liz is a longtime ISIS uh, employee as well, who is a parent educator and a program planner and is mom to a, an adorable toddler girl and another little one on the way. Um, today, uh, our topic is going to be a little bit different than our usual breastfeeding topics. We're going to talk about relationships and sexuality and new momhood and new parenthood and all of the physical and emotional changes over the first year of life after you deliver your first baby. Um, and um, let me initially just say that uh, this is not an all-encompassing webinar. In fact, I envision, I had a hard time making these slides because I envision this to be uh, actually a full um, hour-long expert speaker webinar where I have a pelvic floor specialist and um, an OB or certified nurse midwife to talk about birth control in more detail um, and maybe a, a, a counselor or a relationship um, uh, specialist to talk about some of those changes. So really uh, what I'm doing is giving an overview um, from my perspective and uh, from working with many, many moms and uh, babies over the years, um, this is the kind of stuff that I think it's helpful for someone to tell you. So um, maybe people tell you this and maybe they don't. This is not always stuff people talk about. And I don't know how long this webinar will take me, so I'm going to try to keep it to the 30 minutes. Um, okay, so first I want to talk about some physical changes. And um, physical changes during pregnancy persist after you deliver your baby. And this is awkward for some women because uh, your body has changed quite a bit and it may not feel as familiar to you. You may look in the mirror and uh, not always like what you see. A lot of these changes are uh, semi-permanent or fade with time. So for example, during pregnancy, um, the linea nigra is that dark line that extends, not everybody has it, but it, many people will get a dark line from their belly button uh, to their to their uh, pubic mound, and that will gradually fade with time, um, but uh, it will stay for several years. Um, relaxin is a hormone that allows your ligaments to spread, and that's really important because as your uterus grows, the, the fetus displaces a maybe you go from a 32 to a 34 uh, band size on your bra. So your rib cage actually does get broader and your hips of course get wider and you probably remember that ligament, that round ligament pain, shooting pain in your hips uh, during pregnancy. Those are physical manifestations of your pelvic bones expanding to widen your birth canal. And um, all of your bony joints and ligaments are affected by relaxin. So for example, moms are surprised to find that even their uh, shoe size is bigger sometimes after having a baby. So the extra weight uh, of pregnancy and then there's like 50 tiny little bones in your feet all held together by ligament that allows your feet to spread and shift. And sometimes these don't go back uh, after having your baby. So you're, you, your foot really may be a little bit wider or a half a size bigger than it was before you had a baby. Breast changes from pregnancy, the areola gets darker, uh, the breasts usually grow, um, are tender during the first trimester and may grow during the second trimester. You may see more uh, blue veins on the surface of the, of the breast tissue. Um, and then, of course, stretch marks, which are those silvery, uh, whitish marks. Sometimes the sides of the breasts and the sides of the, the hips get those. Those don't go away, but they do fade with time. And if you're very self-conscious about stretch marks, avoid uh, sun tanning because it's scar tissue and they will not tan. So if you darken the skin around the stretch marks, it makes the stretch marks look more um, prominent. So the red marks will fade with time, but the silvery um, portion of them doesn't really go away. Um, birth. So I don't need to tell you if you've had a baby that um, <laughs> pushing a baby out of your vagina 
can change your vagina a little bit. And um, if you needed stitches, if you had a tear or an episiotomy, uh, hopefully that healed up uh, within a week to two. And uh, it's awfully quite tender. If someone had a really bad tear or problems with the stitches, sometimes that's problematic because um, it t can take four or even six weeks before everything feels completely healed down there. Um, sometimes you need estrogen creams to improve the healing and um, sometimes uh, people are very, very uh, terrified to, um, to to try putting something back in the vagina after it's finally healed. C-sections, you might think that if you had a C-section, um, then you shouldn't have any issues with the vagina, but um, C-section also, sometimes there's numbness around uh, the incision, and that can take several years for the nerves to kind of uh, regrow. So don't be surprised if you have some patchy areas along your incision where you don't have a lot of sensation, and that, that's a little disconcerting for people. Um, hemorrhoids are common during uh, pregnancy or birth and pelvic floor issues from pushing. Um, sometimes moms are surprised that they uh, are a little bit leaky, uh, particularly after uh, the second or third pregnancy. Um, and um, lochia, which is the bleeding that happens after delivering a baby, and that can uh, taper on and off for as long as four to six weeks, and it can be kind of like a spotty period. Um, Okay, and then postpartum, I think we talked about some of the skeletal changes. So your rib cage will shrink back down, your hips probably will not. Um, and then of course, as we love to talk about on Twitter, usually around um, the fourth and fifth month, you get a massive shedding of hair. Um, and uh, this none of this is due to breastfeeding. These are all the hormonal shifts of pregnancy. Uterine involution, this means that after you deliver your baby, um, Around two, uh, around a month or two later, uh, you may still look like you're uh, four and five months pregnant. So one of the most devastating things for a mom to hear when she's out doing errands uh, and has her baby at home is is uh, when is the baby due? When she's had her baby uh, a month or two ago. So expect that you will look four and five months pregnant for a couple of months, and then um, the the abdominal pouch, uh, the sort of the poochiness, um, that actually is called uh, diastasis, and I can post a link about that later. Um, all the crunches in the world may not heal that up. Um, there's uh, some special. Um, steps that you can take to, to kind of really work on flattening the lower abdomen. Um, if you're not breastfeeding, usually the menstrual cycles will come back around uh, somewhere between four to eight weeks after delivery. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about when you may expect your period when uh, you are breastfeeding, which is fairly random. Um, and uh, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then breasts. Uh, of course, uh, if you are breastfeeding, usually there's that period of very fullness uh, during the early week. Um, your breasts may be larger, quite a bit larger, fuller, um, sometimes uncomfortable during the first month or so of breastfeeding. Usually by the third month of breastfeeding, breasts begin to adjust a little bit. And um, uh, usually around the fifth month of pregnancy, breasts may, excuse me, of breastfeeding, breasts may begin to feel a lot more normal, softer in between feeding, um, less engorgement, leaking, spraying, um, and you may go back down a cup size. And often women worry that they're losing their milk at that point, but that is just a, a normal um, body adjustment to breastfeeding. The milk is there when you need it, uh, but it's not kind of on uh, overdrive. The breast changes that women um, don't like about breasts, where you're youthful and have firmer breasts, and then as people get a little bit older, the breasts are softer and they do sag or droop a little bit. These are from pregnancy, and these are not from breastfeeding. So a woman that's had three pregnancies, three births, um, three babies, even if she never once puts the baby to her breast or expresses milk not once, she still will have uh, softer, saggy, or droopier breasts because during each pregnancy, the firm uh, fat of the the breast is taken over by milk making tissue and then uh, as long as the breasts are making milk the tissue re remains a little bit firmer that, that way and then um, when breastfeeding is completely over the milk making tissue shrinks up a little bit and since the fat has already been displaced there's just less um, less density in the breast tissue so it's not from breastfeeding that this happens okay so let's talk about all of the sex that 
you may not be having. And of course, a lot of women worry inside, is there something wrong? Is there something wrong with me? Am I, have I fallen out of love with my partner? Uh, I have no sex drive. But um, it's, it's just a very disheveled woman, and the doctor is saying, I'm afraid you have what is known as children. Uh, this really cracked me up because a lot of people really do think that there's something wrong with them, the fact that they just have um, very little desire for sex. And, and um, it's not surprising when you think about it. Um, low libido probably has a lot to do with uh, natural family spacing, child spacing over, uh, over our evolution. Um, we are not like little jackrabbits and uh, we don't push out a new baby uh, every 10 to 12 months. And um, believe it or not, rabbits actually do uh, de deliver a litter of pups and then can get pregnant again within uh, a few weeks to a month and they will deliver litter after litter after litter. Um, humans are not like that. And um, so probably the low libido has a lot to do with uh, encouraging a little bit more time between the birth of, of children. But certainly um, our lifestyle has a lot to do with it. Uh, you're typically exhausted when you have a young child and it's very common for uh, moms or even both partners to say, frankly, I'd rather sleep. You know, given the choice between having sex or sleeping, I would choose sleeping hands down. Um, your hormones are a little bit um, focused on the baby. So particularly when you're breastfeeding, you don't have estrogen and you have a lot of oxytocin. And oxytocin is the hormone of love. Um, and a lot of that love is centered on your baby. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. I do though wanna just put a shout out for thyroid levels because uh, thyroid level disruption is very common during the time frame after pregnancy. And so um, during the, the first uh, six or so months after delivery, um, if you are feeling uh, not quite right, it's definitely worth talking to your doctor, uh, having some standard blood work done and checking your thyroid levels because hypothyroid often mimics um, depression, low libido and fatigue. Typically women um, feel uh, slow, dumpy, cold, uh, have trouble losing weight, gain weight easily. And hyperthyroid uh, can mimic postpartum anxiety um, or even OCD. Uh, there's a lot of nervousness, irritability, jitteriness. Uh, the weight just drops right off. Um, uh, can't sleep well and so on. So a lot of these things that uh, we worry may be emotional um, adjustments or, or uh, mood disorders after pregnancy sometimes are actually caused by too low or too high thyroid, which can be corrected by medication as soon as it's identified. Um, and then, of course, just feeling touched out by the end of the day. When you have your baby in your arms or at your breast a lot of the day, maybe you have a toddler who's pulling on your leg and then you have a job with expectations and then you come home and there's laundry and there's dinner to be done. And by the time you just collapse on the couch for 15 minutes, and your partner comes over and drapes himself around you. You know, that may be kind of the last thing you think you have the tolerance for, just feeling touched out and exhausted. Um, being the ultimate nurturer and um, feeling perhaps like you're doing a lot of giving during the day and um, that can get tiring. I want to emphasize that particularly the first year and the first baby is a really hard time. If you look at any of those lists of the biggest life stressors, having the first baby is truly the biggest life stressor out there. So it's bigger than graduating college and getting your first job. It's a bigger deal than buying your house or even getting married. It's even a bigger deal than losing a parent. Um, having your first baby changes everything about your life. And it also changes your, your sense of self and your identity. Um, and it changes your relationship pretty dramatically um, and from both sides, your your side and your partner's side. So again, uh, you know, putting this together, I mentioned to Liz earlier, um, actually probably says a lot about um, my own experiences and um, my own feelings about uh, about life after my babies and so on. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be general and not to generalize and make assumptions as to what various moms are feeling. Um, but I have worked with a lot of moms over the years and I, I think that much of this may resonate. Um, 
the first year after you have a baby, those first few months, uh, you may rise to levels of bitchiness you just never before imagined you could. And um, it's hard, you know, when I say make an extra effort to get along, um, you know, try not to, to nitpick and try not to be critical or sarcastic and passive aggressive. It's really hard because that may be how you feel a lot of the time. And you know, in the early uh, days of your of your relationship or your marriage, you may have doted on your partner and taken care of your partner. It's kind of like when you have a second baby, all of a sudden you expect your toddler uh, to, to be more self-sufficient and to grow up a little bit. And so sometimes it feels that way too. Maybe in the old days, um, you know, your, part, your partner would leave his cereal bowl in the kitchen sink every day and you would wash it every day. Um, and, you know, it was just, you know, almost cute that he couldn't pick up after himself. And now now it is not cute at all. In fact, seeing that cereal bowl every day may irritate the hell out of you. And not only that, but both of you used to leave the house in the morning and go to work. But now you're walking back and forth in front of the kitchen sink 50 times a day before noon. And so it festers on you even more. And it's easy to let that resentment build up. Um, there may be uh, there may be verbal or nonverbal thoughts about you know who has the harder time here. Your partner gets to take a shower and leave the house and go to work and have a real lunch and actually sit in the bathroom um, and have privacy, whereas you have the harder job. You're home with the baby constantly, no break, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, and then your partner don't forget has a stressful uh, work load as probably as well and comes home and just wants a few minutes to sit and to veg and um, sometimes it feels like you're just waiting for that door to open before you pounce um, and so it's it is it's a very very stressful your tongue when necessary, apologize if you need to, because these things can be contagious. Um, if you're bitchy to your partner, if you're snipey, then your partner may think that that's an okay way to act too and gives it right back to you. If you apologize, if you make an extra effort to be nice, to, to be loving, um, hopefully that's contagious and that comes right back to you too. Remember that at some point you decided it was going to be a really good idea to have a baby with this person and so re remind yourself all of the qualities that you you love about your partner. Also understand um, the way that your particular partner deals with stress. Um, does your partner really need to do some physical activity, uh, go play sports or um, go for a run even though you've been home alone all day and your partner comes home from work and you know then wants to go out for a 45 minute run? Um, you may have some resentment over that but is that going to overall help the way the rest of the evening goes? Um, also a lot of partners uh, get very very worried about finances um, and uh, work in the first year of life after a baby. So for them, it may be the realization that they're, that they're growing up and that they're adults now too, and the way they embrace uh, or cope with that new role is to really uh, take on that serious role of breadwinner. And so um, sometimes there's longer hours at work or they want to get a second shift or another job um, and uh, are very, very focused on um, the financial stresses and so on. And that's pretty common. Um, another thing I'll just say that can really help your relationship is sleep. Your libido will return when you're getting regular sleep. When you're so physically exhausted, it makes it makes your thought processes frazzled. It makes your emotions on edge. I'm sure that there are people that are listening now who are at the verge of tears. So, you know, some of these things that we're talking about may make you emotional or just little things throughout the day. You may feel sometimes like it will just take the littlest thing to make you break down and cry. Um, and a lot of that is sleep deprivation and sleep fragmentation. So wearing my, my, um, my sleep support hat here, I can tell you that when you are starting to get five to seven solid uninterrupted hours of sleep, you will feel so much better. Um, and we can help. So I'm not going to talk about sleep in this webinar. Um, we have a whole other webinar series for that. But um, please call for a sleep consult if you are struggling and exhausted and at your wit's end. Um, because when your child is sleeping a little bit better, you can sleep a little bit better. And that really helps a lot of different things. Okay, keeping your relationship strong takes a whole lot of work and guess guess who has to take the brunt of that work? I'll give you two guesses and it's not your partner, it's you. Um, and 
you know, without sounding um, like Debbie Downer here, I will say that this is a long-term relationship that you're working on here. And relationships go through cycles and you may have periods of time where you're getting along really well and then periods of time where you're each busy with your own work or your own hobbies or you're not spending as much time together. There may be times where there's a lot of sex and it's hot and heavy and then there may be drier spells in your relationship. So think of this time frame of life after you have a baby as just another cycle in your relationship but keep in mind where you want to get your relationship back to. There's nothing that can replace a good sense of humor and just talking to your partner. Um, you know, I should probably put that communication and humor on every single slide. Um, I think I kind of wanted to maybe make put these slides at, at, in a different order, but I'll, I'll just deal with the one I've got here. Um, a, a lot of times, um, simply talking about the fact that um, you know that it's been a long time since you've had sex. Maybe your baby is is uh, ten weeks old, and maybe uh, you stopped having sex when you were seven months pregnant. You know, just acknowledging the elephant in the room can actually. Uh, make your partner feel a lot more relaxed because then he or she realizes that it's not something that you've completely forgotten about. You're acknowledging that there is a dry spell and that gives your partner hope that um, at some point the dry spell may come to an end. Just talking about it though uh, makes it something that's not as uh, scary and intimidating because it's not a topic that you're avoiding. Um, and you can laugh about it. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you can lay down and, um, you know, kiss each other goodnight and say, wouldn't it be nice if, if we felt like having sex? We're both just too exhausted. At least you can talk about it. Um, and then a very common conundrum is that um, the typically the one time that women often feel uh, most interested in sex is in the middle of the day when the partner is uh, nowhere around. So uh, that's probably when you're sitting on the couch and, you know, you're nursing or holding a sleeping baby and you're drowsy and you're mind wanders and um, you know that's a good time just to call your partner and tell them <laughs> um, again just you know taking advantage of, of the thought and just putting it out there verbally um, doesn't mean you have to do anything about it or act on it but embrace those sexy thoughts because um, that's just you know a flicker of light that gradually becomes the flame that gradually begins to feed your relationship again marriage or your, I don't want to, I don't know another word for your relationship. It sounds funny to keep saying relationship. But remember this, that uh, 18 years from now, if you do everything just right, 18 years from now, these beautiful little babies that you're gazing at or thinking about right now are going to pack their bags and leave and go to college. And if, if everything goes according to plan, they will only come back for visits. Now, I know that that is a shocking thought for you right now. Um, but really, isn't that your goal of good parenting is that you create an independent, successful young adult, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, your, your children really will leave the nest at some point. And what is the nest? The nest is you and your partner. That is a long-term relationship. Um, and that is not a given. So you will always be the mother to this child. No matter how old they grow, you'll always be the baby's mother, your child's mother. Um, will you always be your partner's partner? Will you always be, you know, the wife? Um, that's not a given, particularly these days, where where there's uh, you know so many uh, so many difficulties in relationships and and staying together. So remember that that is the relationship that always needs time and attention. Ne don't take it for. wearing picture but I just love the fact that it demonstrates so nicely um, the love affair that we have with our young babies um, you know your skin to skin you're touching and kissing them how many times a day do you kiss your baby 50 100 150 you can't even count that high they're so delicious they're so perfect they smell good they make sweet sounds they sigh they can do no wrong they're frustrating sometimes they leak or they won't sleep and so on but they're your beautiful little perfect baby i remember when my beautiful perfect little baby was an infant i felt like my husband turned into a hideous oaf an oath. Just listening to him chew disgusted me. He could do no right. My baby could do no wrong. And that's just the kind of mindset you got to shift yourself out of. It's normal to fall deeply, deeply in love with your baby over 
I don't know, I was going to say like the, the first six months, because, you know, usually the first month, if you're a new mom listening and your baby is under six weeks old, feelings of ambivalence are normal. You know, you may think, am I bonding with my baby? Am I maternal enough? Sometimes I, sometimes I secretly wonder if I'm ready for this, or I wish I could, you know, I could turn him off or put him away for a day or two. I love him, but I'm really tired of him. Um, those are normal thoughts and normal feelings. Um, then there comes a period of time where you just fall utterly and deeply in love with your baby. And sometimes that's to the exclusion of your partner and partners sometimes really feel left out. Again, your physical needs um, of holding and cuddling and touching and skin to skin and the intimacy even of breastfeeding, um, you're getting a lot of your nurturing needs met during the day. And so by the end of the day, they may be more than met. You may not have a whole lot left. Um, and remember that you used to dote on your partner and take care of your partner and love and kiss your partner. And now your partner may feel like the third wheel and may feel a little bit neglected. So think a little bit about what tiny, simple little things you can do uh, to make your partner still feel like you are in love with, with, with he, him or her, he or she. Um, do, you, you know, do you give a little call or a text message during the day? Do you buy a special little um, favorite dessert? Do you, you know, what is it that you do? Little tiny things things um, that just let your partner know that you're thinking of them during the day um, and that you love them and appreciate them. And like I said, I really hope that when you start doing these things regularly, after you do it five or eight times, it will occur to your partner that maybe they should go get a little special treat for you too and so on. So it may come back to you. Okay, so now we're going to actually talk about <laughs> getting down to it. So um, thinking about these first sexual encounters. It can be a while and it can be intimidating because uh, particularly if there were issues with fertility, if there was a lot of timed intercourse, uh, if there was even high technology involved, sometimes uh, sex becomes mechanical um, or or something that you're doing out of, uh, you know, out of with, with uh, stress to try to become pregnant and, and so on. Um, and some parent, some couples are so relieved to finally find themselves pregnant um, that they don't want to mess with it. You know, we all know that in most situations, it's it's normal and healthy and fine to have sex during pregnancy, even right up through the day you deliver. But that doesn't mean that all couples do. So if there was history of miscarriage or early spotting or just you know various physical issues. So there's a lot of reasons why people at some point stop having sex, whether it's, um, you know, early or mid-pregnancy or toward the tail end of pregnancy. And then depending on what type of um, labor and birth and delivery and recovery scenario you have, um, you know, it really, it really can be uh, as much as, you know, six or nine or even 12 months since the last time uh, that you had intercourse with your partner. So um, if you if you became pregnant and your baby is three or four months old and you did not have sex during pregnancy, yeah, it's been a year. And just like anything else that you haven't done in a long time, uh, it can begin to take on a life of its own and feel really, really intimidating. Um, and when you are working uh, in conjunction with your partner to take care of a baby, you may feel like you are co-parents or roommates or housemates or two ships passing in the night who coordinate uh, schedules and routines so that, you know, uh, this one you sleep now and then your partner sleeps later and so on. And, and so to actually think of yourselves as a sexual couple together again can also feel a little bit awkward. Couple that with not feeling so positive about how your body feels, worrying that there's going to be discomfort um, from an episiotomy healing, um, feeling like uh, your uh, your body isn't isn't um, the way that it used to look, uh, worrying how it may feel to your partner if you had stitches, if you. Um, uh, if you um, had a tear, uh, sometimes women, I mean, you, really, we are so insecure and we are, <laughs> I shouldn't assume you are, I am so, was so insecure. You know, sometimes women will think, um, you know, he's not pushing me, he's not asking, so I'm not going to bring it up. Um, or he's not pushing, you know, what, does he not find me attractive anymore? See, I really, you know, I really am hideous. I don't turn him on anymore. He's not even asking to have sex. Um, so, you know, again, sometimes the guy can't win. Whether he's hounding you or he's leaving you alone, you're going to paint it negatively um, and uh, it's a, it's a no-win situation. And besides,
sides. You know, there's all that resentment. You're pissed at him for leaving the, the cereal bowl in the sink all the time anyway. Plus, last week he got to go out and play poker, and this weekend he's going to get to go out to the hockey game. So, you know, why the hell? vulnerable position. They may be afraid seeing all of the changes that your body ha has encountered through pregnancy. They they saw you, um, you know, grow a baby and nine months pregnant and birth that baby. However you managed to birth that baby, they saw things they never imagined seeing before. So if you had a C-section, they saw your uterus put right up on your rib cage. Um, and uh, they saw that baby coming out of that birth canal and you know that, that was something that's that that is a big surprise to them um, and so they may truly be in awe of you um, and um, a little bit intimidated or just afraid to hurt you uh, or hoping that you're going to make the first move and let them know when you're ready um, sometimes uh, the viewing you in the maternal role thing um, I've had a lot of moms say that it's weird you know that um, it's one thing to refer to you as mom when they're talking for the baby, like, oh, do you want mommy to hold you? You know, let's ask mommy where the washcloth is. Um, but you certainly don't want your, most people certainly don't want their, their partners calling them mom, like, I am not your mom. Um, but are they thinking, you, thinking of you as the mother of their child? Um, that's okay, because you can have multiple roles and identities. Uh, so you can be a different person, uh, you know, in, in the bedroom with the door closed. Um, again, we talked a little bit about how partners may feel um, a little bit displaced or um, I don't want to say resentful of the baby, but um, you know, your attention, your focus, your care, your nurturing, um, your touch is very focused on the baby right now and it used to be focused on them. Uh, your partner may not want to bring it up um, and um, also that anxiety about uh, finances and work and being the breadwinner and, and supporting the family and a lot of stress. Don't discount um, the, the stress of new parenthood for, uh, for the non-birthing partner. Um, and then worried about the future of the relationship. This is something, I kind of put this in here like a euphemism, but this is something that people don't talk so much about. Um, but uh, there's there's a fair amount of research that showed that that um, guys are actually, if there's a, when there's a delay to resume uh, intercourse, guys are actually afraid that they're going to have um, a, a uh, sexless marriage. So that's why it's just so important to talk about it and laugh about it, um, because at least it reassures your partner that it's on both of your minds, even if you're not able to act on it just yet, or you don't have the energy or the interest yet, at least you're acknowledging the fact that you know it's been a while and, you know, it'll take some time, but you guys will get back there. Uh, and then, of course, not all partners are intimidated. Um, and gosh, you know, you may hear an awful lot from your partner about the six-week visit. When's that visit? When's that visit? Also, um, you know, today being Valentine's Day, I often chuckle because a lot of moms in the in the Great Beginnings New Mothers groups would tell me um, that when there was a special date, whether it was the anniversary or the partner's uh, birthday or, you know, some special date, I imagine Valentine's Day is, is a day like that, um, it really raises the expectation that there's something very special going to happen. Um, and yes, the six-week visit is one of those, uh, you know, circle dates on the mental calendar that, that sometimes guys are counting down to. And, you know, we used to chuckle and say, six-week visit? No, 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 no. Tell them it's a six-month visit. Um, because some women just don't feel ready at six weeks. Um, other women do. And, um, you know, if it's something that's been on your mind and, and um, you're somebody who, uh, has been, you know, quite sexually active. Uh, if you're if you're feeling healthy and healed up, some some women like to try to have sex before the six week visit, so that if there are any issues, they can they can talk about that with their midwife or OB. Um, realize that sex means something different. Uh, and again, I don't want to I don't want to put words into people's mouths, and I don't want to assume that all relationships are male female because they certainly are not. Um, but in the case of a man and a woman relationship, um, there's a lot of, of common and you know popular literature, but I think real you know real information too that shows that men and women do view sex uh, differently and for different purposes and so on. Um, and this this phrase 
I quote a fair amount, I think it's really true uh, for many people, not for all, that women really need to feel close and loving in order to want to have sex with a man, but men actually use sex to feel closer and more loving to you. So that is a really interesting thing to think a little bit about because if you're resentful of your partner and not feeling particularly warm and loving to him, uh, you're not going to want to have sex with him. And um, sometimes that increases the distance between you because sometimes, and maybe people, I'm not, I'm, I don't watch the chat room because I, I just look off into the corner and babble like this, but um, maybe people, uh, you may or may not want to say, but a lot of people will say that after having sex with their partner, the partner is so much you know, nicer and warmer and caring and more helpful around the house for several days afterwards. It's so funny. Uh, some moms will say, you know, yeah, when I, I wanted to have the, uh, you know, the, the storm windows put taken down for the spring and, you know, oh yeah, he did it with a bounce in his step the next day. So just something to think a little bit about. I, I don't, I don't want to um, make assumptions, but um, you, the way you view sex and the purpose uh, for sex for women is often about, uh, nurturing and uh, for men it's about feeling close. Uh, if your partner tells you that that he or she doesn't think you've ever looked um, more beautiful, really believe him or her. Um, and then when you are ready to have sex, um, thinking about it, go very very slowly. Don't jump right in with intercourse. Dip your toes in the waters of intimacy. So regain nice and slow, start slow, particularly if it's been a while. Um, the longer it's been, the more awkward and intimidating this whole business becomes. And so um, begin to think of yourselves again as a romantic couple, not housemates, co-parents, roommates. Think of the things that a couple or that you guys used to do and roommates don't. So two examples I'll use here are back rubs and showers. Be very clear right up front that this is not, not foreplay and there's no expectation that this is going to lead to something uh, more intimate or um, uh, intercourse. So for example, you can put it right out there and say, okay, um, I'm going to give you a 10 minute back rub and massage and you're going to give me a 10 minute back rub and then we're going to go to sleep. Okay, and this just helps you get comfortable touching each other again, being a couple again, having some skin on skin again, bearing your bodies in front of each other again, slowly, 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 uh, with no expectation that it's going to um, turn into something else. And that in particular is very helpful to talk up, to say up front, because if you give your husband or your partner a 10 minute back rub, he or she may think that it's an overture to something else. And so if you don't want that to be, uh, make sure you say so. <laughs> This is uh, the Bravado Nursing Bra ad. Um, is this how you feel? Do you look and feel that beautiful and glamorous? Feeling sexy like that with your nursing bra on? Not bloody likely. So you may feel that your breasts belong to your baby. Again, I shouldn't make assumptions. I hope you do. I hope you feel that way. I'll just say that that is not how I looked or felt when my babies were little. Um, you know, you put on the shirt that has the less spit up on it, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> okay, so if you feel like your breasts from here to here belong to the baby um, and you don't want them touched and they're tender and, you know, they're leaking and half the time, uh, you know, they're, maybe they're, you got you got wet nursing pads on and, you know, you just, it just doesn't feel very sexy to you. That's fine. Put that area off limits. Again, not making assumptions, but let me tell you that if it's been a long time since your partner has gotten any, if you say, honey, you can have a little bit, but don't touch here, they'll be perfectly happy with that. Um, and on the other hand, it's perfectly fine to put that zone in the active zone too. If, if your partner's into it and you could care less either way or you're into it too, what the hell, you know, it, that it's it is, uh, it's part of your body and maybe your breasts were an active part of sex play before and, uh, you know, you can keep your bra on if that makes you feel better. You can tell your partner not to touch there uh, or whatever, do whatever. It's, you know, whatever goes on between two consenting adults, that's up to you. 
most important thing is your self-esteem and feeling better about your body. Um, very few women love their body between uh, the second and six months of life after a baby. They, you know, it's, it's still a lumpy, loose time of adjustment. Um, if you are still wearing uh, your sweatpants and your yoga pants and um, some uh, mid-pregnancy maternity clothes, please pack that stuff up and put it away and go to Target uh, and get yourself a small, nice new wardrobe of clothes that are attractive and that fit you um, and that you will feel pretty in. Please try not to look at the tags. If it says size 16, so effing what? Just get yourself some clothes that you can put on every day and feel a little better about yourself. Then think about what makes you feel a little more attractive and better about yourself. So everybody's a little different. Some people care about their hair. Maybe you need to get your hair styled or colored. Maybe you need a manicure or pedicure. Um, maybe you love going to the dentist and getting your teeth cleaned or, or whitened or brightened. Um, maybe it's a massage that you want. Everybody is different, but do the things, take the time, spend the money that's going to make you feel a little more positive about yourself and your body. Try, even though you may not be near your target weight, try uh, to eat mindfully and to eat less junk and um, stock your kitchen with snacks that are going to be better choices for you so that um, you don't feel, you don't even add that to your, uh, to your negative self-image at the end of the day. I can't believe I ate that whole sleeve of Thin Mints from the Girl Scout cookies. Um, you know, if you have a bowl of strawberries in the fridge that are already washed and ready, maybe you'll grab a handful of those instead. Get out every day in the sunshine and take a brisk walk with your baby. Uh, if you are more ambitious, go back to the gym uh, or, or uh, you know, do your, do your other uh, exercise routines, but at least um, try to get out and walk every day. It just begins to help you feel more positive about the way you're taking care of yourself. Try to make this be uh, an empowering year. This is the year your body has done something absolutely amazing from something the fraction of the size of a sesame seed. You have grown this entire being who is in your arms uh, or in your, in your uh, vision right now. And um, yes, a partner uh, contributed some very important uh, DNA to make the child too, but that can't be seen on the head of a pin. Everything that your baby is really came from your body. You, Even if it took fancy fit footwork to get that fertilized egg going, um, you grew it, you birthed it, and most of you, many of you are continuing to feed it with your milk. I mean, it is amazing and empowering. And try to focus on um, what I call mama strong, which is, which is just an expression I use to say, like, you are a strong and powerful female person. You have done something amazing. Um, what's called cognitive restructuring and positive affirmations, that's what that means. It means get rid of those negative phrases um, and, and change them to a positive mindset. Um, if you don't know what cognitive restructuring is, look that up. Um, and you will understand what I'm talking about in terms of some, some self-image messaging. Um, it really is, you'll feel better about your body. Um, you can make yourself feel better about your body, and that's important. Okay, so do you just wait for it to happen naturally? Moms in the Great Beginnings group would say all the time, well, you know, it, it's my baby's eight weeks or 10 weeks or 12 weeks and we're just, you know, we're all, we're tired or we're just waiting for it to happen naturally. Um, it can become the elephant in the room. It can become the thing that no one wants to bring up or talk about. The longer it goes, the more intimidating and awkward it can become. I would have to say, open the calendar, stick your finger on it, circle the date, and <laughs> work yourself up to it. Like sometimes, like Nike says, you just got to do it. You may, it may not be high up on your list. There may be many other things you would rather do, like sleep. Um, but sometimes, <laughs> pardon the expression, just get over the hump. Just do it. And you would be surprised um, how much better, how much, how relieved you feel that at least you've done that. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, so do you just wait for it to happen naturally, for sex to just, you know, organically happen? Um, I would have to say probably not for most of you. But you're not weird if you don't want to have sex. And you're not weird if you really do want to have sex. <laughs> um, and you're not weird if you want to have sex during the day when your partner isn't around. Um, all of those things are normal. So I have a little rhyme. It says circle a date, circle a date, 
then lubricate and inebriate lubricate and inebriate. Uh, yes, you can thank me later. I put my little trademark sign there because I've been saying that for years. I may have stolen it from somebody. I don't know. Um, but uh, these are words of wisdom, lubricate and inebriate. Uh, when you are breastfeeding, you do not have estrogen circulating in your system. And estrogen is responsible for vaginal lubrication and the elasticity of your vaginal lining. And so, um, some lubrication will really ease the way. Trust me on this. Um, also, I've had some some uh, women say to me, I took your suggestion and I brought home a tube of Astroglide and my partner acted like, you know, it was like the sexiest, kinkiest thing I've ever brought into the bedroom. Um, well, I don't know about that, but I will tell you that uh, lubrication will really, really make a big difference. And in particular, if you're using condoms, which we'll get to on the next slide, um, there's you know nothing uh, less pleasant than uh, dry vaginal walls and a latex condom. So lubricate and inebriate. A glass of wine, you will be a cheap date. A glass of wine will make you sleepy and very relaxed. Um, and that's, prob that's probably a good thing. Um, so go ahead and have a glass of wine um, and get your, uh, get your astroglide at the bedside. And having sex after you have a baby is another phrase I like to use. You are a born again virgin. So there are so many correlations to thinking back the first time you had sex. Um, maybe, maybe you know, you were tense and anxious and ambivalent. Maybe you weren't really sure if you were doing it more for him than for yourself. Um, maybe uh, it was really rushed and hurried because you had an ear out listening for you know a parent or a roommate. Uh, now you've got your ear out listening for somebody else. Uh, maybe you were really scared and tense and you were afraid it was going to hurt. Maybe it did hurt. Um, and maybe it wasn't particularly enjoyable in the least. Um, it does get better. Remember that uh, it, it, nobody, nobody has, you know, the best sexual experience of their life uh, the first time that they have sex and uh, certainly not the first time you have sex after you have a baby. It takes a little practice. Um, and it, it may not be spontaneous, uh, like pre-baby. Um, you may have to really plan it. You may have to plan through your birth control. Um, at the end of the day, you may be too exhausted. Maybe you used to have uh, sex and then go to sleep at night. And now, um, you know, that may not be the best time to have sex in your relationship. It may be on a weekend morning, for example, or if your baby takes a fairly routine, um, you know, afternoon nap, that may be the best time. So um, be open-minded about where and when it can occur. Um, and uh, it may not take place in the bedroom. So if you're, if you're bed sharing or co-sleeping or your baby sleeps in your bedroom um, and you're feeling self-conscious about having sex near the baby, the living room couch may just be the place to go. Uh, so again, there's a lot of uh, similarities to uh, some of your early fumble sexual encounters. Also, um, uh, it may not go as planned. So <laughs> you may uh, you may be, be ready for the for that first time and you may be all psyched up and you know baby may wake up halfway through and like I said you just gotta laugh. You gotta laugh. Okay we're we're almost done. I know I'm keeping you guys long. I hope you're I hope you're enjoying it. I guess I'll find out later. Um, birth control. Well I happen to know there are a few people here who uh, <laughs> does not mean that you can't get pregnant. Um, these days, uh, what's called lactation and renorrhea, the LAM method, um, many women don't really practice uh, ecological breastfeeding these days anymore. There's pumping in bottles, there's pacifiers, there's um, encouraging babies to sleep longer, stretches at night, etc. So you know, so maybe 50 years ago, the lactation and renorrhea method actually worked fairly well um, and was a somewhat reliable uh, source of birth control during the first six months after breastfeeding, assuming that mom was breastfeeding uh, pretty much um, around the clock and hadn't had her period back yet. But remember that first you ovulate, then you get your period. And so what that means is any single one of you sitting there at home could be ovulating right now and not know it and have sex next week and get pregnant and never get your period and not realize that you're pregnant until 
two months from now when you wonder why your nipples hurt so much um, or why you're feeling sick in the morning and so on. Uh, and so you don't always get your period as a heads up that your fertility is beginning to return. Now, many women, the first cycle that comes after having a baby is what's called anovulatory. There's no egg released. Um, it's just the sloughing of the, of the uterine lining and your body getting ready again to, um, to, um, to cycle. Um, and uh, However, like I said, um, you certainly can, and it happens all the time. People get pregnant when they're breastfeeding. So if it would be devastating and extremely distressing for you to fi find yourself pregnant, um, by all means, you should be using some birth control. Um, if it took a, a long time and difficulty to have your baby, and you're, you know, you're, you're pushing. Uh, into your 30s, um, you know, mid 30s, late 30s. Uh, you'd like a little bit longer between babies, but you know, it, it would be it would be a surprise to get used to for sure. But it wouldn't be the end of the world if you found yourself pregnant again. You know, then maybe you you make another choice. Um, but remember that you can get pregnant when you're breastfeeding, and you better <laughs> you better take care. Um, I generally encourage people, uh, well, I shouldn't say encourage. Uh, I, I would generally um, say in terms of hormonal methods of birth control, like uh, the mini pill while breastfeeding, I think it's better to wait until breastfeeding is well established and until your sex life is picking up a little bit. So you know, starting at six weeks and having to remember to take that pill every single day and um, adding the hormones back into your system it's, it's not supposed to impact milk production, but in some women it can. Um, and all of that, if you haven't even started having sex yet or you're having sex you know, once or twice a month, um, maybe it's better in the short term to use a barrier method like a condom. Um, so sometimes people will start using uh, condoms in the early uh, months and then you know, around uh, four or five months, then move over onto the mini pill. It's up to you. Discuss with your healthcare provider. Uh, when you are breastfeeding, the mini pill is the is the birth control pill option. It's a, a progestin only pill. You don't want estrogen on board, um, especially if you're exclusively breastfeeding. Uh, toward the toward the end of the first year, a lot of people will switch from the mini pill onto the combo pill. Um, if you don't think you want to have a baby for another couple of years or longer, then consider an IUD, which is a really nice form of fix it and forget it birth control. Um, it's placed in uh, an office procedure, not particularly comfortable, but hell, you just had a baby, so uh, it's really not that bad. Um, and then uh, there's a tiny little thread, not like a tampon string, but a tiny little thread uh, that's way up in the vagina that you feel for um, after, uh, after your menstrual cycle or once a month or so. And essentially, it stays in there until uh, you decide you want to have a baby, try to, try to become pregnant again, and then it's taken out in, a, in an easy office visit, uh, and you are immediately fertile and ready to uh, try becoming pregnant again. So uh, the IUD is a pretty good choice uh, for a lot of people. Uh, the mini pill is reliable birth control when it is very tightly controlled. You have to take it at the same time every day. You cannot be casual about it, um, and so on. And when will you get your period back? Luck of the draw. So maybe people can say in the chat room um, if and when they've had their period back. Um, if you are, um, if you're breastfeeding and uh, exclusively your baby's under six months, you're up uh, once or twice at night at least to breastfeed. Hopefully, you won't get your period back yet. Um, I always feel so sad for the moms who get totally ripped off and get their period back six weeks after delivery, even though they're breastfeeding a newborn around the clock. It is such a bummer, um, and usually, you know, it, it's just it's just the way. Uh, an individual's physiology works. Um, then there are women who are lucky. Um, I, for example, my my son. When I was nursing my son, I think I didn't get my period back until like, now. I can't remember if he was 10 or 11 or 12 or 13 months old or something like that. But I mean, he it was around a year, maybe later. I can't remember now. Um, but he was, you know, he was nursing maybe uh, four times, three or four times in 24 hours total. It wasn't, you know, like he was nursing around the clock. And he slept. Um, he slept through the Night. So a lot of people will get their period back once they start going six or eight hours with no nursing or pumping. So when the baby is sleeping longer, often that's when the menstrual cycle will come back. Um, do track your cycles. 
um, and uh, they may be different if you had heavy periods uh, beforehand. Um, they may be more manageable now. Uh, the first period may be heavy, but just in general, um, you know, symptoms like endometriosis are often um, improved by breastfeeding. Okay, I see we're getting late, so I'm just going to kind of wrap up here. We could talk forever about this stuff. The bummer is that I'm talking to myself. I know I see you all here in the room. I can't read. Um, I can't keep up with the chat and still think and talk at the same time. Um, but yeah, you know, I much prefer doing this in the Great Beginnings New Mothers Group setting where, you know, there's actual interaction. I hope you guys are having a good conversation um, in the chat room with Liz. I'm sure she is. Okay, uh, final words. Um, yeah, how can you wrap this up? Um, I don't know. You guys, you got to talk to your partner. You got to laugh. <laughs> you got to laugh. You have to make an effort, even if it's not fair. It's not fair that it falls to you. You have to do everything. You have to care for the baby. You have to make the doctor's appointments. You have to cook. You have to do the laundry. Yes, your partner helps, but come on, aren't you Julie, the cruise ship director here? You are running the show, and you have to nurture the relationship too, and it's just not fair, but you still have to do it because you want your partner, I hope, maybe, you want your partner to be there five Five years from now and 10 years and 15 and 20 and 25 and 30 years from now you still want to be together a, a loving supportive couple and so this is the first year after having a baby it is a hard year so you know try try to stay together as a team um, and um, okay going back to my bullets like I said before um, I don't want to say sooner rather than later but you know you may not want to sit around and just wait until you feel like it. I don't know when you're going to feel like it. Um, sometimes um, starting to have sex again reminds you that you actually like sex <laughs> and that maybe you start to feel like it a little bit more often. Or maybe you just like the fact that, um, you know, that, that finally somebody is touching and nurturing and loving and cuddling you instead of you doing all of the, all of the cuddling and nurturing um, all day long. Or maybe um, you like it because it makes you feel closer to your partner and it makes your partner be more loving to you. Or maybe it's because, um, you know, your partner seems very happy afterwards and, and you know, puts up the storm windows, like whatever. Um, but dip your toes in and get started. Um, don't keep putting it off longer and longer because it becomes harder and harder and scarier and more intimidating. Next bullet, don't get pregnant unless you want to. Um, it can and does happen all the time. So uh, heed the warning. Condoms aren't fun, but your partner, most likely if your partner is male, your partner would will um, rather have sex with a condom than not have sex. Um, so put the responsibility over to your partner for a little while. Um, remember that relationships have cycles and um, that think of this not as, not as um, you know, <laughs> the beginning of the end of your relationship, but, you know, a low point if you're not getting along so well and what can you do to get along better um, and improve it. Um, and again, remember to feel good about yourself because when you have positive self-esteem and positive self-image, um, even if you're 30 pounds uh, over where you were, um, you know, 18 months ago, um, you know, you you can make yourself feel better about yourself and remember that mama strong thing and be empowered about what your body has done this year um, and take care of yourself. Whew. Okay. And come back next week. <laughs> I'm all embarrassed. I think I'm just going to um, say goodbye and thank you. I can't wait to uh, read the chat transcripts later. I see, oh, I see so many friendly faces here. I think I see, um, I see a chat version here. Uh, Nino's here today. I think that's the first time we've actually gotten her in the in the chat room. Liz, thank you so much. I'm sure I can see this was a very very busy uh, uh, chat board to moderate today, um, and I really appreciate the work that you do there to keep everybody uh, on good behavior because we got we got tough tough crew here. Uh, I see Becky said she got some lube for Honey for Valentine's Day. <laughs> Becky, whether it's for you or for him, I am sure that he is going to appreciate the hell out of that. Nothing, nothing could make him happier. 
Okay, I'm just going to say goodbye. Um, come back next week for breastfeeding webinar and chat. Please put it on your calendar. Please help us spread the word. Do your job. I'm trying to do mine, so you guys do your job. Your job is to spread uh, the news about ISIS parenting um, on mom boards, on what's this new one, Hello B. I need somebody who's Hello B to, to start getting um, our stuff all over the place there, please. Um, and uh, this is the year we're expanding here at ISIS, and so uh, we are uh, building awareness. That's my job. E-learning means um, being out there building awareness. Everybody, um, maybe you'll have sex this week. I don't know. I hope you. I hope uh, if you do, it's good um, or good enough to let you uh, get started trying it again. And um, bye.